We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Welcome to this session. My name is Jonathan Charles. I'm the Managing Director of Communications at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And for many years, I was a BBC uh, presenter and foreign correspondent. So this is our high level uh, leaders panel of the 16th annual Internet Governance Forum. Uh, and for uh, the next uh, few minutes, we're going to be guiding ourselves through a session, which is uh, answering the question, global economic recovery, where are we at? We're joined by our panel, some of whom are in Katowice, Poland. Others are joining online. The uh, fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic has underscored the need to take concerted action to revive the stifled global economy and unlock growth factors in both developed and developing countries. Global economic growth was uneven even before the pandemic, of course, as was progress on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Countries now have a chance to leverage the economic recovery as an opportunity towards sustainable and inclusive development. And the digital economy can play a fundamental role as an enabler of opportunities for human development and economic improvement. The importance of investing in information and communication technologies and making them available to all segments of populations is one of the lessons of the recovery. Uh, ICTs offer opportunities to both developed and developing countries as accelerators towards high value added information economies that can offer equitable and sustained growth for all. At the same time, the ongoing global di digital divide risks becoming the new face of global inequality. This is a pressing challenge and closing the gap must be a top priority. So the panel is going to uh, discuss an approach to data, platform-driven services and disruptive technologies. How can that pave the way to economic recovery and sustainable development? So let's uh, begin our discussion. I will uh, introduce the panelists, uh, some of whom I think are, are still joining. Uh, and I think uh, with us uh, from Slovenia is Bostjan Koritnik, the Minister of Public Administration. Perhaps you would like to uh, say a few words to start our debate, Bostjan Koritnik. Uh, hello, I just uh, feel honoured to be invited to this great panel. And um, I must uh, apologise up front, I will have to leave early. So um, the technical difficulties will have some impact. So. Uh, please proceed. I won't take any more time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, perhaps you could give a few words, though, on uh, how you see the issues that we're facing. Well, uh, first, uh, as for the lessons learned, I would say that in just a year and a half, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, radically changed the role and uh, perception of digitalization in our societies and economies and uh, accelerated its pay pace. Um, digital technologies are now imperative for working, uh, learning, uh, entertaining, socializing, uh, shopping, and accessing everything from health service to, to culture. Uh, and they offer immense opportunities for improving service delivery, uh, participatory processes, and engagement with our citizens. Um, the pandemic has also taught our governments to what extent it is possible to make better decisions with the use of data and uh, data already used as a key resource for startups and small and medium sized businesses and for the development of their products and services. And therefore we should uh, further support the implementation of advanced technologies such as uh, artificial intelligence, big data, uh, internet of things and the blockchain. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Accelerated digitalization has brought us many benefits, but it has also exposed the weaknesses of our digital space, uh, accentuated the global digital divide, and the impact of disinformation on our, on our democratic uh, societies. And therefore, we should pay attention that these technologies are trustworthy, uh, human-centric, and focused on fundamental rights and values. Um, and finally, in order to make the digital transformation successful, uh, we should not only invest in new technologies and the connectivity, 
but above all in people and their skills to be able to use these technologies. Thank you very much indeed uh, for the moment. Um, now, I think some of our panelists are on site in Katowice. Uh, I'm hoping that Iyad Mohammed Al Khatib is there, the Minister of Communications and Technology from the Syrian Arab Republic. Uh, can you hear me? And if you can, perhaps you'd like to say a few words. Yes, I, yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Good evening, uh, good, uh, good day, everyone. I'm so pleasure to be with you in these meetings. Uh, as you know, the pandemic now is, uh, of, of Corona is attack the world. We heard about the fourth wave or five waves of Corona pandemic, which called uh, Omicron. What the, the lesson we learned from the Corona virus after 2019, all the t cities around the world uh, is locked down. So the big change, big challenge which the government faces is how we collect all the vital resources and infrastructure for the citizens in, in their, their homes. The internet is contributed and remain to availability and reliability 24 per hours, 24 hours per day, seven day a week for the humanities in his uh, cities in his homes. The road, the, the rush traffic has moved from the, the road in the cities to the internet. So a huge traffic in the, in, the, in the internet has been done. So the big challenge now and the big uh, solve now we need is we need to build a huge infrastructure of telecommunications and network in, and internet networks for accommodate the, the traffic which came from the humanities. That's why we need to spend a lot to spend a lot of um, infra, um, huge uh, investments to build these networks. By the other way, also the digital services imposed from the coronavirus is the powerful element for the digital economic. Why? Because the development of digital services is so fast and grow so fast in compare of traditional uh, economic. Thank you very much, Mr. Charles. Thank you very much indeed, Minister. And also, I think, uh, on site in Katowice uh, is Janusz uh, Szczyzinski, the Secretary of State for Digital Affairs at the Chancellery of the Prime Minister and Government uh, Plenipotentiary for Cybersecurity of Poland. Uh, Janusz Szczyzinski, are you there? Yes, I am. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to welcome you all uh, to Katowice. Uh, the ones that are here on the ground, I would like to welcome the most, but also everyone who is online. Uh, it's too bad that you couldn't be here, but it's great that we can uh, speak. Thanks to the technology that has changed uh, the way the world looks, and I think, and the recent uh, months, years uh, showed that uh, something which, uh, you know, and uh, just a few years back, we would say, oh, people can't come, well, then we'll call it off. And actually, the first IGF was called off due to uh, pandemic reasons, and now, it's probably uh, it's probably not the first, not the second, not probably even the tenth event that you will be all participating in online, and I think that this this shows how the world has changed very rapidly, actually. And when we talk about public policy, usually uh, the horizon for change is you know decades, maybe even maybe some maybe a few years in, in some matters. And here we have proved that it's possible to change the world very, very quickly, and the, the change can affect our lives in the matter of months, one and a half year or so. And why is that possible? And why uh, I think that it's so important that this is a part of the United Nations agenda? Because technology and the internet is something which has extremely significant economies of scale. 
uncomparable to other infrastructure investment and other things that we want to do to achieve the sustainable development goals. And this has shown that, uh, of course, there's some investment to be made, but once it is made, we can use it towards so many good goals and so many important things that we can then copy and share and, and provide to billions of people across the globe. So this is why I believe that uh, the, the, the digital uh, transformation is something which will uh, drastically increase the speed at which, at which we will be able to uh, achieve these goals. And I'm very, very happy that we can now say that what will probably some futurologists have said before that this is what's going to change the world. Now we can say that it is it was true and that there is limitless possibilities to more things that we can do. And I'm very, very happy that we are here to talk about it. And I hope that uh, this event, uh, which uh, is in Katowice, in, 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 the, in, in a very important part of Polish history, uh, is actually a 100% global event because people that participate in it don't necessarily have to be here. So uh, a warm welcome to everyone. And uh, I hope we'll have a very interesting panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, and you're absolutely right. I was hoping to be with you in Katowice today. Sadly, I can't due to uh, the UK government's self-isolation restrictions at this end. Uh, so, of course, uh, I'm joining you online. Now, before we hear directly live from some panelists, we have a video message from uh, Armida Salsia Alice Yabana, who is the Executive Secretary of UNESCO. Maybe we don't have a video message. Let's see what's going to happen. Just give it a sec. Excellencies, distinguished panelists and delegates, allow me to extend my sincere thanks to Mr. Liu, USD of DESA, for inviting me to speak at the 2021 Internet Governance Forum. I welcome the opportunity to share once again perspective from Asia and the Pacific at this forum. The Asia-Pacific region in 2030 will be a vastly different place to what it is now and digital connectivity will be a driving force. Every day we witness how emerging technologies are rapidly transforming our development paradigms, bringing new sources of added value to production and consumption patterns and the way societies operate. Applications of new technologies enabled by affordable and reliable digital connectivity for all can act as accelerators toward inclusive digital societies. Furthermore, as the very recent emergence of the Omicron variant of the coronavirus shows, the pandemic is not going away soon and digital will continue to have an important meaning as many of our activities remain in virtual mode. Of key concern is that Asia and the Pacific remains the most digitally divided region in the world. While the region has a number of leaders in technology innovation, more than half of its 4.1 billion people remain offline. Less than 5% of the region's population has access to high-speed and affordable internet, while countries in special situations face even more challenges in their pathways to digital connectivity. A further concern hampering today's recovery is that the digital divide may be widening during the pandemic. For example, early data shows that investment in next generation networks appear to be falling short of projections. The digital divide that emerged during the pandemic related to access, speed, gender, and rural isolation are deepening socioeconomic inequalities in new ways. Nevertheless, new opportunities are springing up from these challenges. Allow me to highlight three. First, on the supply side, the region has a critical window of opportunity to scale up investment in digital connectivity infrastructure and digital technologies. There is ample evidence that when the COVID-19 pandemic intensified in 2020, digital technologies in some countries, such as China, Japan, Republic of Korea and Singapore helped to mitigate cluster outbreaks while gaining the public's trust by sharing credible information in real time. 
Second, in terms of the demand side, investment in digital literacy and capacity will have significant net benefits for innovation. Digital education for lifelong learning with attention to the needs of children and youth at the forefront, but also vulnerable groups such as the aged and disabled has taken on a new urgency for an inclusive digital society. In this regard, ESCAP and DESA have promoted regulatory sandboxes and policy experimentation for innovative deployments of digital technologies. We thank DESA for this partnership and look forward to further strengthening our joint work on promoting digital governance before Third, there is an opportunity to strengthen global and regional cooperation and partnership with governments, business sector, and social groups. Only by working together will we ensure that these technological breakthroughs work for the economy, society, and environment in an inclusive and sustainable manner. In this regard, ESCAP is working with member states to develop a practical action plan for implementation of the Asia-Pacific Information Superhighway initiative from 2022 to 2026. The action plan consists of three pillars with 25 actions centered on connectivity for all, digital technologies and applications, and digital data. This action plan will serve as a blueprint for regional cooperative actions, and we look forward to collaborating with you all, including DESA and other partners of our UN system and international organization to bring universal digital connectivity and digital transformation to a more inclusive digital society. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Uh, let's go uh, live now back to Katowice. Uh, there should be uh, Lu Zhen Min, uh, who is the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. Lu Zhen Min, uh, how do you see uh, where we are right now? Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for moderating this. Uh, panel discussion on global economic recovery. I also join my panelists in thanking all the participants here. Also, I want to take this opportunity because this is my first appearance at the 16th IGF in Cordovis. So on behalf of the United Nations, welcome all participants to the 16th IGF in Cordovis. We are now convening this IGF, 16th IGF in hybrid format, but we are encouraging more participants in person in the, in the city. Uh, dear colleagues, I think it be, of course, um, the, 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 this global pandemic uh, has been uh, affecting the world and disrupted the life of the human beings for almost two years, almost two years. So uh, last year, in 2020, we had to convene the IGF entirely virtual until the virtual, but uh, this is also due to the, the, the help of the digital technology. But this year, the, we are able to, to come in this hybrid in hybrid. It means that there is some progress of recovery, recovery. But I want to share with all the participants that be, uh, my department, UN Department of Economic Social Affairs, UN DESA, uh, is one of the entities looking after the global economic forecasting. Our latest Analysis indicates that be the economic growth is projected to expand by 5.6% in 2021, following a contraction of 3.6% in 2020. But this it means that there is a slow recovery. That be it means that be a number of countries they have enjoyed the growth in 2021, but challenge that be this growth is uneven, uneven. Our latest data indicates that be about half of the UN membership, it means that be around 100 countries, their economic growth will not go back to their 2019 levels, the pre-pandemic pre levels in this year, this year. So it means that we should take still another year to get to the full recovery, depending on, oh, depending on the progress of our, the mitigation of the pandemic. So this would be the scenario we are going to confront uh, in 2021, but we should not lose our confidence. 
But what we need to learn from 2021, that be how, what has made this progress for recovery. First, vaccination. You will see around the world, think for those countries, they have a very good progress in vaccination. I think they also have enjoyed good progress in recovery, in economic growth. Because the vaccination help people to get into work, help people to get into life, also for consumption. Second, the investment. I think it'll be for, for the past year, uh, or even before, since 2020, for those countries who have been capable to invest with the stimulus, package of stimulus plans, I think they really they help to, for, for, for economic recovery. But for those countries, they have limited capacity for investment. I think, of course, the, the, their recovery has been slow, especially the case for countries of special situations and the mid-income countries. Not to see the diff LDC countries and African countries. So investment is a big issue. Uh, so third, I think it'll be, of course, we, we really have seen from the past two years that be, this is uh, the, the, the level of access to digital technology. I think digital technology has, has helped the world to be connected, to survive from the pandemic. I want to, to help the countries to recover, but this is uneven. We're still around half a population, half a population, it be, be uh, 3.7 billion global population have no access to, to internet, to digital technology. It means these people not being benefited to e-learning, e-commerce, as well as e-education, I think e-medical service, and all the, all, the, all, the, all, the, all the digital service. I think for those countries, they also can be slow in recovery. It, it means that digital technology has been important contributor to the global recovery. So what we need to learn from this recovery, current recovery, also from pandemic, that in the coming year, we need to encourage our country to re reinforce their efforts. First, to have the global vaccination. G20 has responded and supported the initiative by WHO to have a, uh, to ensure that be by 70 percent the percent of the global population in each countries to be vaccinated by mid of 2022. I think this must be achieved. This must be achieved. Only this objective achieved, the world would be relieved from the current pandemic. I think it'd be it'd be so it'd be it be detrimental to the global recovery. Because you know, now it be because the international the international connection has been really seriously affected. International travel has been affected. International tourism entirely damaged. Damaged. So global chain has been affected. Global chain supply has been affected. So we must ensure that this vaccination be ensured by globally by mid of next year. Second, we encourage all countries to reinforce their efforts for the investment. Uh, investment not only to in, to in the infrastructure, but also in how to keep the small business alive. Because for many countries, small and business, they are the main sources for, for attracting and providing the, the employment, employment. So because the employment becomes very most serious issue, most serious social issue in all countries, in all countries. So, so that's I think we need to be only when they be, we could keep they be to increase the, the employment in all countries, then we could avoid a social crisis in, in, in the third year of the pandemic. pandemic. 
At the same time, investment also be to be reinforced to help those countries which are affecting this kind of a debt crisis. Now already, I think 44% of this uh, uh, debt uh, affecting countries that be facing kind of a challenge that be even the risk of death, debt default. So we need to ensure that be in the coming months, we can help these countries. That's why the IGF has initiated a new plan for the new amount for special joint rights. I think the Secretary General Antonio Guterres has appealed that be for those countries with they don't need the share of our special joint rights should be contribute this share of a, to other countries they, which you need. We need. So, so, so avoid the, 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 the kind of uh, debt crisis or, or liquidity crisis for some countries is also critical, critical. So globally, we need to avoid it be, although we, we already had a very serious historical unprecedented economic crisis, but we need to avoid kind of a financial crisis, a financial crisis. I think you know, the, the, uh, the, the, of course, third area, through this IGF, we need to promote and, and advance, encourage member states to be, to find a way how to narrow in down this digital gap. Especially for those countries we have, we have left, they already left, left behind in digital technology. I think it'll be we really need international support and the international help. So for the United Nations, we want to make good use of this 16th IGF in Katowice to appeal to all the people in the world, support vaccination, support vaccination. Vaccinate yourself is vaccinate your family. And it helps your family, helps yourself, and helps the world, helps all your countries. Only when this world is unvaccinated, we should be get back to the normal life, to the pre-pandemic period. I thank you. Thank you very much, Olu Jianmin. A very important message indeed uh, there. Right, let's hear now from the director of the International Telecommunications Union, uh, Doreen Bogdan Martin. Doreen, how do you see where we are right now? Thank you so much, Jonathan. I'm assuming you can hear me. I can. Super. And of course, a special thanks to our host, the government of, of Poland. This is a, a very timely discussion. So where are we in terms of lessons learned? I'd like to focus on, on perhaps just two. And I guess the first, and this picks up from previous speakers, is the vital role of digital connectivity. And of course, the wide disparity in digital access and use. Um, just last week, ITU launched our, our new connectivity figures where we saw that COVID actually contributed to an unprecedented global connectivity boost. The number of internet users grew by 17% over the last two years. Of course, this is the, the biggest increase that we saw in over a decade. But of course, there's the flip side, as the Under Secretary General has just mentioned. We, we have 2.9 billion people, or 37% of the world's population, that have still never, ever connected to the internet which of course means that throughout this pandemic, they have been excluded from education, from employment, from getting information, and of course, other services. On top of that, the 4.9 billion that we count now as connected are actually many of them struggling with connectivity. That's perhaps too infrequent, too expensive, too slow, or too hard to access. And of course, many of those that we count as, as, as unconnected are those that actually need connectivity the most. So that brings me to my second point, uh, which is the big scope for partnerships to dramatically change the connectivity picture. COVID has shown us what we can achieve when we work together. Of course, vaccines is a, 
a great example, as the Undersecretary has, Undersecretary General has just stressed. At the ITU, we rolled out our Reg for COVID platform when lockdowns began. It's a platform that enabled governments, regulators, operators to share experiences. Um, I think what impressed me the most, what inspired me, was that we saw this incredible level of camaraderie by the industry to keep up with the unprecedented demands. Uh, from the data that we got, we saw challenges that all countries must tackle for successful recovery. Uh, so as we look to the future, we need to continue to address the digital divide. We need to continue to invest in digital infrastructure. We need to continue to promote ongoing digital transformation. And of course, we need to build digital resilience to face future crises. And just like the COVID, uh, the COVID challenge, the global connectivity challenge is simply too large for any single entity to take on. Uh, I do want to encourage you to join us this afternoon. We have a session on our Partner to Connect um, Digital Coalition, uh, which is a coalition to connect the world. We see it as a, as a big game changer uh, that will bring a, a whole of society approach, pull together different parties, galvanize available resources, and also focus on concrete pledges and, and commitments. And you can learn more about that, uh, as I mentioned in our, our session this afternoon. Jonathan, back to you, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Doreen. And uh, we'll be hearing from you again a little later on. Uh, let's go now to Simonetta De Pippo, the uh, director of the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs. Again, uh, what, how do you see where we stand right now? So thank you very much, good morning everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. And, uh, and the moment is particularly, I mean, timely, this, this, this event, because, yes, on one side, COVID-19, I would say another of the plenty of, I mean, among plenty of challenges that we as humanity have to face. Uh, um, in, in reality, the Office for Outer Space Affairs, as you know, is an office of the Secretariat dealing with all space affairs in the UN. And we really strive to bring uh, the benefits of space uh, to, to everyone. And in doing so, clearly, connectivity is one of uh, uh, the topics we are dealing uh, with, with a certain attention. Um, and, and I have to say, as was mentioned also by other colleagues during, in this panel discussion, um, well, sometimes we need, uh, we collectively need a crisis uh, to look at potential solutions, which were there already, um, available, at least from a technological standpoint, but we were, you know, a little bit struggling in, in trying to bring it through the channels in, in the various systems, in particular when we talk about developing a, and emerging countries. So, uh, in, a, in a way, uh, COVID-19 helped us in, in pushing a little bit the connectivity agenda. But allow me to, uh, to remind everyone that uh, the Secretary General was uh, instrumental in dealing with, you know, digital cooperation, the digital cooperation report, in particular for what the Office for Outer Space Affairs is concerned, recommendation 1A, when we talk about connectivity everywhere, and where obviously mega constellations of satellites have a role to play. And we are dealing a lot with this, trying to support uh, the Secretary General also in preparation of the Common uh, Agenda Summit of the Future uh, that he called uh, for September 2023, where I see connectivity across the board, the main seven high-level tracks uh, uh, part of the, of the Summit of the Future. Um, last but not least, uh, space, uh, and in particular space economy, is, um, and, and in particular, the part of space economy, which is on the downstream, which means how to use space-based data and infrastructure to uh, improve the quality of life on Earth. Well, for sure, uh, and I would like to underline sure, um, the, the space needs to be considered more and more as an accelerator for the accomplishment, the achievement of the SDGs and as was mentioned several times, uh, partnership is key. And I would like to underline again that SDG number 17 is exactly partnerships for the goals. And this can be applied to what we are discussing here. So thank you very much for giving me the floor.
Thank you very much indeed. And let's start to dig a little deeper. Um, with us in Katowice is Teki Akwete Falconer, the founder and executive director of the Africa Digital Rights Hub. Perhaps I can ask you, um, what do you see as the challenges impeding the achievement of the UN uh, SDGs as a result of this pandemic? Thank you very much, Jonathan. I, I think that if, if there's any emphasis that uh, COVID-19 has given to all of us, is the fact that the entire world is more connected than we have made ourselves to be. Um, the, the biggest challenge, as we saw with COVID, especially in my community, is that it emphasized the importance of technology and also emphasized the you know, the digital divide that continues to exist in communities like Africa. Um, I could clearly see, even with policies that were implemented in my country, um, how the poverty line will continue to increase without adequate information on how to target the poor. Um, I could see how poverty increased uh, how hunger was then extended to the more vulnerable because even distribution of resources, you know, could not be targeted to the most vulnerable. It definitely affected good health and quality of education. I always share an example of, uh, and I live in the city uh, where there's a young boy I was helping. However, within the period of the COVID, he had to drop out of school because he did not have access to the technological tools that would enable him connect. So whilst the importance of technology is being emphasized in all of these, it is also showing the big gap that continues to exist between the rich and the poor. And we are even seeing that in the extent of, um, you know, the distribution of vaccines and all of that. But if there's anything that I would love to uh, talk about here is the importance of the fact that, you know, we are not an island and no community is isolated from the other. As we have seen with the spread of COVID from one end of the earth throughout the earth, and we've seen how it impacts, it is very important that we ensure that no one is left behind. And in order to do this, we need to ensure that our countries are collaborating, industry is collaborating, and civil society, and everyone else that is important is brought in to ensure that we meet the SDGs. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, and we'll hear from you again a little later. Uh, Bostian Karitnik, I know you have to go in a minute, but I'd like to ask you one thing. We were hearing a little bit about uh, what uh, the obstacles might be on SDGs. What do you see as the obstacles standing in the way of digitalization, further acceleration of digitalization? Um, I firmly believe that connectivity plays an important role in accelerating digital transformation, if I may add to what the other panelists also emphasized. And in the past months, we have learned that being connected uh, is not a matter of choice or preference, but a necessity that enables us to go to school work and communicate with the outside world. Um, I believe it is essential to improve the broadband coverage and ensure the security of the 5G network. So we should do our utmost to ensure that digital connectivity is developed in a manner based on trust and transparency. Uh, significant investments will be needed in the future to achieve connectivity goals and this can be done uh, in the form of more intensive cooperation between the public and private sector. Uh, we should make large-scale infrastructure investments attractive to the private sector and we need to provide equal access to ICT, uh, foster the development of necessary skills and ensure the inclusion of vulnerable groups such as disabled and the elderly. Um, only by doing that, we can enable equal connectivity for all. Um, as the Slovenian Minister for Public Administration, I am happy to say we are fostering connectivity. For example, we are constructing next generation broadband networks in wide spot areas. Uh, we are co-financing with public funds 
broadband networks in areas where operators have no market interest. And also, we are ambitious when it comes to smart cities and communities. We want them to unify solutions in terms of data opening and interoperability and are prepared to help them with financial incentives. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to uh, speak at this uh, great panel and uh, uh, stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you stay healthy as well. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, Minister. I know you have to go. We have about six minutes left. We have to end uh, on time at 12 o'clock. Um, I'd like to turn to Iyad Mohammed Al Khatib, the Minister of Communications and Technology at the uh, Syrian Arab Republic. Uh, Iyad Mohammed Al Khatib, what do you think is standing in the way of the achievement of the UN SDGs because of this crisis? Uh, thanks again. I think uh, we will face. Uh, Many, change, many, many challenge, challenges, especially for the government, for achieve the uh, SDGs goals. But I will, but I will take uh, and explain about the three items of them. The biggest one and first one, as my colleague uh, mentioned, uh, the infrastructure. The infrastructure must be strong and must be um, uh, power for accommodate all the traffic which come from the citizens when the cities is locked. We need to um, install many digital platforms. By these platforms can the uh, uh, governments produce many, many of services produced from the uh, citizens, especially for, especially for e-learning and e-health and uh, e-employee also. The other item in the same uh, infrastructure, we need to exp uh, explain and uh, install, uh, sorry, for, we need to install uh, a huge uh, telecommunications uh, networks and expand all the networks uh, sectors for accommodate uh, the traffic, traffic from the citizens. The two challenge, uh, two items of challenge, we are talking about uh, the content digital content, we need to improve, we need to accelerate the digital content uh, on the web um, for e-health, for e-business, uh, e for e-commerce. That's why uh, we need to um, spread uh, new uh, digital uh, transactions. All the citizens must be learned about the digital transactions. Uh, the third one uh, I will mention about uh, the uh, very important things, which is uh, the human resource skills, especially for uh, humans, uh, employees, not for, uh, uh, not for um, uh, private sector, only, also for all the nation sector, private and government sectors. All the employees must be, has um, a skills, uh, skills which, which mean uh, change the mentality of how handle the transactions. So I think, in my opinion, I think we need to, to uh, create a new uh, care color uh, uh, oriented to the uh, students in, uh, in schools and university. Uh, that, that's why it means digital adaptations. Digital adaptations is very important for the human resources and for the human employees. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have uh, five minutes left, so I'd like to ask you some quick fire uh, answers now. And uh, what I'd like to ask you all, uh, you know, a large number of the world's population still aren't using the internet as we heard today. You know, what in your view then uh, can be done? One thing that can be done to really accelerate that digitalization, to unlock the internet for all. Uh, really a quick fire answer of just one thing. Um, we, Xin Men, uh, perhaps I can ask you as Under Secretary General for uh, Economic and Social Affairs, we, Xin Men, one thing that would accelerate digitalization. Of course, uh, reinforce international cooperation, definitely. You know, when we're talking about uh, digitalization, we should not forget that in our world today, there's still close to 800 million people in this world that uh, no access to electricity. You know, for those people, no electricity. What, 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 what sense talking about the digitalization? That's why I think for, for access to 
technology to electricity, as also access to digital technology, we need really international cooperation. That's why I think it would be to reinforcing uh, the North-South cooperation, South-South cooperation as a triangular cooperation would be critical. For, to achieve that objective, we really need to reinforce the international coordination, international coordinated action. That's why I think it would be United Nations could have played an important role, but we need the support of member states. That way we are appealing the support of member states as well as the other stakeholders in the next few years to really to, to, to help the poor, help developing countries to, to, to have ensured access of digital technology and to have the global access of the internet. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Doreen Bogdan Martin, one thing, what would the ITU like to see? Thank you. Very difficult. So assuming that we're tackling the barriers on infrastructure, skills, connectivity, content, local language, my one thing would be to take a whole of government approach to digitization. Okay, that's very clear. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Simonetta de Pippo, one thing. Yeah, even shorter, uh, we need to accelerate the achievements of the SDGs and in order to do so, space is there to support this process and trying really to be the center across the board, the 17 SDGs for all governments and all the stakeholders. Thank you very much. Teki Akwete Falcona, one thing. I would say access. And for me, access means making uh, the cost affordable, building capabilities, um, and then also ensuring we have the right infrastructure. And the most important is that whilst we are talking about the people who need access in this room, we have to make sure we engage with them to know what access means to them as well. Thank you very much. And finally, Janusz Szczynski, one thing. I did some back of the envelope calculations and I think we need 100 billion euros every year to pay for 3 billion people to have internet access. I think that's totally manageable and these are the financials that will make it possible to deliver this on the market basis. And 100 billion euros, when you look back on pandemic finance, well, it's 100% obvious that this is something which is achievable to the global economy. So 100 billion euros. Okay, it uh, sounds small when you say it quickly. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much to all of our panel for engaging. Apologies, by the way, for the technical difficulties at the start, which delayed our start, uh, but uh, to everybody watching, thanks for sparing the time. Bye.